All right, let's start another session. We will be reviewing some NBME style questions. These questions have been written by some of uh, my medical students and I will be uh, analyzing them and giving my input and feedback on these and learn some neurology through that. So let's get started. So here's the first one, a 71 year old female with a history of atrial fibrillation, hypertension and diabetes presents an ED after waking up feeling ill. She's unable to verbally answer questions and has weakness and numbness in her right arm and leg. What is the best initial action? So she has atrial fibrillation, which is a stroke risk factor. She has hypertension and diabetes. All three of them are stroke risk factors. 71, age is a stroke risk factor. And after menopause, female have about equal risk as male. Uh, she woke up with a stroke and she has trouble speaking and weakness and numbness in her right arm. So um, the presumption will be that this will be a large vessel occlusion, uh, maybe an MCA stroke affecting her speech on the right side, left, uh, left, side, left, side, left side of the brain, probably right-handed. So handedness here is important because a right-handed will make you more clear that this is a left brain dominant uh, and the best initial action will be a CT scan of the head. You want to make sure it's not a bleed and look at perfusion diffusion mismatch. She woke up with it. So this will be a soft contraindication from administration of TPA. Many places will not do it, but although some experts don't, um, um, they're still doing it. There's some uh, accumulating data that shows that even with a wake up stroke, you, sh you can still administer TPA, but uh, even, um, <clears throat> even if you're trying to decide that you're going to give TPA uh, with this, uh, uh, stroke on waking up, you will still probably do a CT scan before. Yeah, so the answer was CT scan, as by the students, so a reasonably written question. I wouldn't change anything significantly about it. All right, here's a longer question. So this is Jane Doe, which probably means that we don't know who she is. And again, 40 year old is a presumption here, which should say a moderate age woman, uh, unless you know Jane Doe doesn't mean that she's not unknown. Um, for a 40-year-old female who came to the hospital with left-sided weakness and decreased sensation. So again, concern for an acute etiology. Acute etiology and neurology is will be stroke, uh, seizure, so post-epileptic uh, weakness, uh, migraine, complicated migraine can give a left-side weakness uh, in acute you know, cord compression, acute nerve injury or something like that. So weakness and sensation loss has to be either a spinal cord lesion or a stroke or a complicated migraine. Uh, or seizure, not a nerve damage. She currently has a headache with sharp pain and sensitivity to light. <clears throat> uh, let me see if I can have a pointer. Oh, okay, I have a marker. So, um, She's uh, sharp pain and sensitive to light. She explained that she noticed her left hand weakness when she dropped her phone. Starting around the same time, she had trouble walking since her left foot felt heavy and trouble seeing out of her left eye. There is occasionally a feeling of tingling electricity along the left forearm and left leg when touched. So this is dysesthesia. Mrs. Doe feels like her weakness has gotten worse and feels like she is losing control of her extremities. Word, she might be experiencing a stroke. Yeah, very reasonable concern. She denies dizziness, nausea, vomiting, constipation, diarrhea, and constipation. Mrs. Doe comments on how she had left side drool for years and has trouble swallowing foods and liquids. Now, that's interesting. What will give her a left side drool for years and trouble swallowing foods and liquids? Has to be a Bell's palsy and an old stroke. <clears throat> uh, and so this is a strange way of uh, presenting this in a question usually you're not trying to trick someone although in real life this is how things happen but in questions as i've talked before you want to have things more straightforward so you'll say this a patient has a prior history of bell's palsy or stroke she has a history of psychogenic non-epileptic seizures uh, so now it is really interesting with a most recent episode two weeks ago where she hit her head on the edge of her table while working and migraines ptsd depression traumatic brain injury, chronic brain, back pain, and fast alcohol abuse. So this looks like a real case, to be honest. So again, all this complexity would try to uh, simplify it when we are writing a question because we are testing in a question one specific concept uh, and not necessarily an ability to handle the 50 different things in the real life, which 
uh, which will come with practice. So, of course, answering MCQs doesn't mean you're a good doctor uh, because MCQs are supposed to be supposed to be a simplified version of the real life. Uh, she denies illicit drug abuse. She takes cover mezepine, likely for her PNEs, gabapentin, propranolol for the seizures, and acetylopram for the depression. Now, propranolol is likely not for seizures. Uh, but for PNEs, it's likely could be for anxiety or tremor. Gavaventin can be used for seizures, especially for PNEs, although it can even be used for epileptic seizures. All white are within normal limit. On your exam, patient shows no signs of cognitive impairment, clear and intact, except left eye was 2070 for visual equity. Now, this is interesting. If it's a real air deficit in a 40 year old, it should make you worry about uh, something like an optic nerve injury, optic neuritis. Normal muscle tone in bulk. But left upper extremity and lower extremity strength is four plus five. Uh, pin prick temperature vibration process will decrease in distal left upper extremity past elbow and distal left upper past knee. So that's a glove and stocking. So right. So below knee will be a stocking and below elbow will be a long glove. Uh, finger to nose and heat to share intact bilaterally. She walked with the left side limp. Left were all with a normal head CT imaging was normal. What is the patient most likely presenting with? <clears throat> now. If, so let's start with the most obvious. If the patient has PNEs and is presenting with this new strange presentation, then the question first will be, is this a conversion disorder? Now, if this was a question being written to test your knowledge or a student's knowledge of conversion disorder, then that's a very poorly written stem. But it's very likely that this is based on a real presentation, an like actual patient presented exactly like this with this history and i can really see that you know i've seen that but this is not how we write a question if we're because our the purpose of this question could be let's see if someone can detect conversion disorder then this is not a right question now if someone is testing some real intern, uh, real problem and is throwing everything else to make you distract and want to test your ability to not get distracted by these pnes and strange phenomena than what it would be. So a 40 year old female who presents with a left sided numbness and weakness, right? So it's a, a kind of like a, a dense, hemi, a mixed hemiplegia and sensory loss. Now the problem is that the sensory loss being given an exam is not a brain sensory loss, not a central sensory loss, right? So it's a distal lower extremity and distal uh, left upper and lower extremity elbow and knee, so this is a glove stocking pattern. Now, glove stocking pattern is a pattern of a length-dependent de <coughs> length neuropathy. So you don't see this pattern with radiculopathy, you don't see this pattern with myelopathy or spinal cord lesion, and definitely this will be unusual for a stroke presentation. Now, in real life, this is possible, so it could still be a right internal capsular infarct, which is a lacunar infarct, and will give you a mixed motor and sensory pattern. Remember, lacunar infarcts, uh, five patterns. So you have the pure motor, pure sensory, mixed motor sensory. It will be a toxic dysarthria and clumsy end syndrome. So these are the five lacunar syndromes that are known. And this could be a mild weakness, four plus five, in a mixed motor sensory kind of a lacunar infarct. So that is possible. Um, now, is this a peripheral polyneuropathy that is presenting with weakness and numbness? So the sensory loss is a polyneuropathy pattern, a length dependent pattern, but usually it's a pure sensory loss. But uh, a motor weakness can happen. So peripheral neuropathy is also a possibility. Uh, of course, it goes, goes against radiculopathy. It is not C5-6 because there's a lower extremity involvement and it is not Wernicke's encephalopathy. It's not there. So any of the other three are possible. Now, the question is that is the stem written very clearly to tell you exactly which one of the three. There are some elements of conversion. There's some element of internal capsule infarct and there's some element of polyneuropathy. Now, if this is an intentionally done, then that is not a good practice. You know, the questions are not written to trick someone into a wrong answer. The questions are written to really see if someone knows what they're talking about. Uh, and they actually have a clear concept of a particular uh, concept. Um, if I have to pick in real life, I will worry about conversion. And in the MCQ, I will probably go with right internal capsular infarct and see what the answer is from the students. And the answer is conversion disorder and explanation given in notes. We'll not go into explanation again. It may be because she has a mixed pattern of neuropathy and central weakness, and that just doesn't any make sense. And this is conversion disorder. I, I would have probably written the stem slightly differently if I was testing for conversion disorder.
anyways but fair fair answer i would still be a good answer in the real life all right next question a 50 year old female presents in the er after right sided facial droop during the day so right sided facial drooping and uh, before coming to the er she was having difficulty putting on his shirt and shoes so there is some weakness too has stroke risk factor of hypertension and diabetes and hypercholesterolemia takes metformin ramipril and torvastatin cranial nerves are intact does not drink or smoke drooping on the right side and his muscle strength is decreased in right upper lower extremity sensation and vibrations also decrease on the right side bavinsky is present where did the lesion occur so it's a central lesion there is facial droop so it has brain stem and it's on the same side of uh, face uh, and arm and leg so it is uncrossed or non crossed or ipsilateral hemiplegia and facial involvement so it has to be a central above uh, uh, the above the midbrain above pons above the spinal cord so it has to be internal cord internal capsule so internal cortex is not correct so internal capsule or corona radiata slightly more corona radiata rather than internal capsule and of course it has to be left side because it is a right sided presentation all right let's look what the answer is and answer is left anterior capsule so pretty straightforward very uh, good easy question all right next one 69 year old male is brought to the office because of memory issues over the past 6 months so a, a recent onset memory loss is always concerning 6 months 69 2 years ago he had an episode imbalance in which he fell backward into some thorn bushes he now uses a wheelchair oh my gosh so in 2 years there is also a loss of balance in addition to memory problem he has progressively depended more on his 30 year old daughter to remember appointments to help him around the house so this is a very rapidly progressive memory loss in 6 months he is already depend on his daughter for appointments and help around the house she reports that he has episodes of seeing two television screens so either hallucinations or diplopia on exam downward and upward gaze are markedly impaired so there is impairment of up and down gaze or vertical eye movement his limbs and neck are rigid and an mri of the head shows hummingbird sign so now this is a lot of giveaways to tell you that this is a progressive supraduricular palsy hummingbird sign is psp uh, neck rigidity uh, downward and upward gaze mobility but there are few things that actually don't very uh, fit very well with psp psp does not have a rapidly progressive dementia unless this is ftd presenting as psp frontal temporal dementia uh age is slightly older 69 relatively younger seen in psp uh and uh, the two years of progression of balance problem is acceptable but is not but it's too fast usually they don't become wheelchair bound in two years usually it's four to five years and then what's missing here a big picture that is missing here is parkinsonism so psp classically is associated as a secondary parkins as a primary parkinsonism atypical or parkinson plus syndrome uh, so that is missing but they have given you hummingbird sign and they have given you uh, upward gaze impairment to make you think about psp uh, but i will probably make it more of a parkinsonism question um, first and then i would probably not give hummingbird sign because a it's too obvious what you're trying to ask and b this is seen in less than 30% of advanced cases of psp so it's not a very common phenomena everything else is acceptable all right next question let's see what the answer is answer is psp so 76 year old male is seen in the clinic for follow up after a left thalamic stroke that occurred 2 weeks ago oh boy the patient complains of a heavy feeling in his right arm and leg the patient is accompanied by his wife who mentions that the patient has a tremor in bilateral upper and lower extremity that began 2 months ago so it is before the stroke the patient also admits to balance issues his wife also mentions that he has been moving in his sleep more frequently so rem behavior disorder and he has difficulty remembering new information so cognitive impairment examination patient sitting rigidly in his chair and making minimal facial expression so some soft parkinsonism uh, he has mild sensory deficit light touch on the right arm and leg and he has 5 out of 5 motor strength in bilateral upper and lower extremity his gait is ataxic patient stumbles to the left this one he has a small gait takes many steps to turn around as minimal arm swing while taking which protein is responsible for patient symptoms so now it's very uh crazy patient 
has clearly a two months history of rapidly progressive Parkinsonism with bilateral upper extremity, lower extremity tremor. Uh, and then he has Parkinsonism with his gait and, and facial expression and so on and so forth. But there's also a left thalamic stroke that occurred two weeks ago, which is giving him numbness likely on the right side, although there is no weakness. So the question will be, is it straightforward Parkinson's? If that's true, then the alpha synuclein would have been an option. Or if this is a Parkinsonism plus syndrome, uh, a beta amyloid will be uh, Alzheimer's, but this is not a presentation of Alzheimer's too fast. And there's uh, too much of Parkinsonism going on. And tau and prion, now tau will be something like PSP. We don't see the features like of PSP. And so that will be out too. There is still possibility of C, B, G, D. And clinically, this is what I was thinking about because patient can have a unilateral symptoms or asymmetric presentation and a stroke-like symptoms uh, in uh, CBGD, which is very asymmetric Parkinsonism and very rapidly progressive, just like this patient is two months uh, of in history. So clinically, this is what I will worry about, although a little old for CBGD, again, seen in 50s and 60s, early 60s, early, late, early 50s. But here, for the sake of discussion, I think alpha synuclein is probably the answer this, the writer was thinking about. Uh, although this whole story of left thalamic stroke was unnecessary uh, addition um, and um, probably was uh, not required. As I said, MCQ is pretty straightforward. If you're trying to test if someone knows that the pathology protein in the brain is alpha synuclein for Parkinson's, then just make the stem more straightforward for Parkinson's. All right, let's see what the answer is. And the answer is alpha synuclein. So yeah, I would have probably gotten rid of the whole stroke scenario and make the progression more slow. Two months is an atypical presentation. You don't have bilateral upper end or extremity tremors in Parkinson's in uh, in two months. Now, if he's if if the if the writers think about MSA, again, two months is too fast. It should be two years or more of a history in Parkinson's should be four to five years of a history. Uh, or don't give bilateral upper and lower extremity tremors. So too much progression. And cognitive impairment is not Parkinson's, although MSA, uh, again, two months, is so many atypical red flags that this, you know, uh, it will easily confuse someone to answer tau or prion. Actually, prion is very reasonable concern here if clinically I'm seeing a scenario like this. Such a short progression in Parkinsonism, uh, cognitive impairment, I will probably do a prion disorder check first. All right. Let's look at the next question. All right, next question is 64 year old female who presents to the ER due to two day history of expressive and receptive aphasia. Expressive and receptive. So I guess global aphasia, um, two day history. Aside from the mild leg weakness, uh, let me make my face smaller here. Aside from the mild leg weakness, uh, residual from a previous known stroke, and the remainder of a neuro exam is normal. So two days history of uh, aphasia without any other features. Well controlled hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and a DVT. Patient is undergoing chemotherapy of stage four small cell lung carcinoma. Medications include lisinopril, metoprolol, trofloxacin, epixabine. Head CT showed no acute changes. MRI revealed small areas of acute infarct in the left posterior temporal and parietal lobe. So this is a stroke. New stroke presenting with aphasia with a shower. Shower meaning that multiple small infarcts gone into several small areas of acute infarct in left posterior temporal and parietal, which means it's an MCA or anterior circulation uh, showering, which is typical. So it looks like very typical. It could actually be a real patient for all I know, but here, Rather than aphasia, I think the problem is not aphasia, but encephalopathy. Although you can get an expressive Bruca's aphasia and receptive aphasia by two strokes, uh, which are in just in the right location, but is practically speaking is very uncommon. So I would think that rather having a, a mix of Broca's and Wernicke's aphasia, and there's definitely no global aphasia here because there is not enough of an area damage, I, I think that probably there is more of a concern for confusion appearing as aphasia or encephalopathy presenting as aphasia. And a shower can do that. If you have a shower of a stroke, you can be encephalopathic. 
Carotid ultrasound shows less than 50% stenosis bilaterally, meaning uh, that it's either was never a source of the shower or is now the clot is gone. If there was a clot in carotid, if there was a 90% stenosis and now the clot is half broken down to 50%. Echo is unremarkable. What is most likely etiology of suspicion stroke? So definitely it's an embolic stroke. And it sounds like there was either multiple clots or a one clot that broke off into multiple pieces and caused a shower of a stroke. And uh, that will be an embolic phenomena. Now, embolic phenomena in this patient who has a stage four small cell lung cancer means that there is likely a hypercoagulable state due to cancer as a cause. Um, although atherosclerotic plaque rupture cannot be ruled out, but usually it comes just as an occlusion. So if they had a 50% stenosis or more, suddenly broke up, plaque ruptures, and it just forms a clot right there on top of it and cause an acute carotid occlusion. Now, sometimes that clot can broke off and give some pieces that can go out and cause some downstream infarct and the vessel can open back up, but the presentation will not be a two day, it will be much more acute within, you know, last 30 minutes, an hour or two, patient just collapse, can have a seizure with such an acute occlusion. Now, cardiogenic embolus is a real possibility here. And one would argue that hypercalculable state C will actually lead to a cardiogenic embolus. So the hypercalculable state may have caused a clot in the left atrium that has embolized. And maybe echo is unremarkable because it's 2D echo and not a TE. And a transesophageal echo is required uh, in this patient. And, and if I was writing a question, I will probably not put both of them together because one may be linked with the other and I might just remove the cardiogenic embolus if I really want to see if they can pick up hypercognitive state. But this will also be a bad um, option to put in if we are saying that there is no hemorrhage or bleed. Uh, if, because if we're saying that the MRI reveals, then berry aneurysm is out. If MRI, if there was a berry aneurysm, it will show up on MRI. So B was a wrong option to put in. And probably between C and D, I would say the D would have been out. One, only one of the two should have been picked up. Now, hypertension leading to a lacunar infarct is a reasonable option to have uh, so that this you want to check the students know the lacunar infarct happens isolated one at a time and not multiple areas. Uh, Ethrogenic plaque rupture is a reasonable option, although again, it, it is in real life a small possibility, but in an MCQ it would be unlikely with this presentation. And there's an, another option needed, uh, one more option to keep it for, which is reasonable because B and D are out, should not be there as an option. All right, let's, let's see what the real answer is. And the answer is hypercoagulable state due to cancer. And you know, when you give stage for small cancer, then in previous stroke, this is what you're trying to ask. All right, 75 year old male arrives to the emergency department via ambulance, ambulance for sudden onset of right arm and leg weakness. So again, stroke seems to be the theme of this month. 75 year old with right arm and leg weakness sudden onset and has a medical history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia and diabetes, three stroke risk factors. Current medications are atorvastatin, metformin, lisinophil, and emergency were brief neurology exams for four patients. Receives an NIH stroke skill score of 14. So. National Institute of Health, Stroke Scale, NIHSS will be the full name um, of 14, and is alert oriented only to self. What is the next best step in management of this patient? So sudden onset, but we are still don't know how long ago was the end onset. Was it within last three hour or four and a half hour window or not? And the question is that does the patient has uh, a large ambulance occluding vessel. If that's the case, then probably also need thrombectomy. So TP and thrombectomy is the treatment, but before you do TP and thrombectomy, you need to get a CT scan of the brain. So once you get the CT scan and if the patient is within window um, for TPA, which will be extended to this four and a half hour, then you will do a TPA. If the patient is out of four and a half hour, then you have an extended window for thrombectomy. So then there will be the next step. So both of these are reasonable options future down the road. And this, again, future down the road, the urgency is to do a non contrastity of the brain. This is actually a pretty well-written question that I see no problem with, um, and I can use it exactly as, uh, as, uh, as my uh, question. So let's see if that is the answer. And the answer is the non contrastity of the brain. Actually, there was another question on non contrastity of the brain early on, so that clearly seems to be the theme. All right, 65 year old male presents uh, with um, a ED with complaints of a severe 
right sided headache that has persisted for last four hours has headaches over four to five times daily and began in May. He suffered from similar headaches last year from May to July. And he also complains of eye redness and runny nose. So eye redness and runny nose are kind of the autonomic system symptoms during his headaches. He has a history of migraines. What is the next best step management with current symptoms? So question is that does he have two types of headache? Because he does, you know, a headache lasting more than four hours will be a migraineous headache. But again, he also has headaches which are four to five times a day, which is a non migraine If you're having four hours or longer of a headache, it should not be four or five times daily. And it stay, started recently and has had occurred from May to July last time. So, you know, are these kind of an annually recurrent cluster headaches? And this four hours is actually cluster of a headache, meaning that headache coming on, lasting for a short time and going away, and then coming on and then going away. So overall four hour, but not throughout the four hour. And background of a migraine uh, concern also, uh, I will go with more of a cluster kind of a headache presentation here. And if that's the case, then typically for an acute headache, uh, treatment is 100% oxygen. Although many episodes of the cluster headache last less than 30 minutes, so the headache may be resolved. But if it's going on as a cluster, uh, on and off, then 100% oxygen makes sense. And then you have to discharge on some longer term treatment uh, as the next option. The reassurance is good. If the headache resolves, you can discharge him with reassurance. CT scan is reasonable, but I would treat the headache first. Verapamil is for chronic treatment or prophylactic treatment of migraine and will not be a good option. So again, a very well-written question here. I could probably use it as it is, although I will, might make it a little more clear of, you know, what do we mean by history of migraine? Because the only headache history given is that he has similar cluster from May to July. So if you're trying to say a patient has two types of headache, or if you're trying to say that the patient was mislabeled as migraine, you have to slightly clarify it in the stem, but I don't want to make the stem too long either. So I would go with 100% oxygen. Let's see what the answer is. And yes, it is a cluster headache. All right, that was it. So thank you for joining me today. And I will try to do it once a month as I get questions from the student. I will record my impression and explanation of those questions. And hopefully that will be also a kind of a micro lecture or a mini lecture or something useful for you to learn uh, some random tidbits. So hopefully you find it interesting. Until next time. Thank you.